Hi everyone and welcome to the Zero One Garage. I'm Jamie Austin, the Curator and Director of Programs here at Zero One, and we're really excited to be with you tonight to mark the launch, the official launch, I guess, of the American Arts Incubator. This is a program at Zero One that we've been thinking about for about a year and a half now, and this is really our first official launch. We get to introduce the inaugural American Arts Incubator artists and also kind of open up the conversation uh, to our community, which includes all of you, so I hope you think of your questions. Um, the format for tonight, I'm going to introduce our panelists. There'll be kind of a, you know, open round table style discussion. We'll open it up for questions and answers and have quite a good period uh, where we can go back and forth. And then at the end of the event, we'll be introducing uh, the four artists and we'll have a little bit more time for networking and discussion that way. Uh, so the American Arts Incubator is really inspired by business incubator and microfinance models that a lot of them have really been pioneered here in Silicon Valley. I feel like at Zero One, that's a lot of what we try to do, being based in Silicon Valley, of kind of think of the Silicon Valley spin that can really be applied to the arts context um, and thinking about creativity and innovation in that, in that sort of way. Um, the American Arts Incubator is an international exchange program that sends American artists abroad to partner with local communities to create collaborative new media and mural art projects. And the program is really designed to be a hybrid between a training lab, it's a production workshop, and it's a public art exhibition focused on using art stimulate dialogue and promote cross-cultural exchange. So, you know, there's a lot of these business incubator models. Think of Y Combinator, but this is the arts, and we're kind of sending it abroad to uh, test out these new and innovative ways that artists are creating work and bringing that to communities that'll be focused on specific social issues that have been identified um, in each country where this program is taking place. So later this evening, I have the honor of introducing you to our inaugural four artists who are sitting here in the front row. And they've been spending all week at Zero One as part of their orientation. So they flew in from all over and we've had kind of a American Arts Incubator boot camp. Um, a round table, we've been learning about their ideas for workshops and for proposals. And then in next year, beginning in February, between February and May, they'll be traveling abroad for periods of three to four weeks to work with local communities and create collaborative art projects, and we'll be introducing you to them uh, a little bit later. But it's really exciting to see this program finally coming together, because we've been thinking about it, and having everyone here sitting exactly where you are is really where we've been all week. I've just kind of had chills in hearing these ideas and questions that have come up, um, and it's just a really exciting time for us. We're really happy to have you here and being part of this whole celebration and launch event with us. Um, so our discussion tonight, features three prominent thinkers who joined me on stage, and um, I'll begin by introducing them individually before we jump into our discussion. So next to me here is Sean Hewins. Sean is a lawyer, a designer, and what I would call a lawyer slash designer. <laughs> um, he serves at in-house counsel at IDEO.org, which is the nonprofit arm of IDEO, and leads the Amplify program, which is a five-year effort funded by the UK government for international development with the goal of making international aid more collaborative and human-centered. And Sean has led design workshops for social sector professionals, students, and entrepreneurs from Zambia to Pakistan to New York City, and he holds an undergraduate degree from Columbia University, a law degree from Georgetown, and has attended the Massachusetts College of Art and Design. So he's one of those multidisciplinary people who somehow tend to end up here at zero one. <laughs> Uh, next to him, we have Rosalind Swig, um, who's also known as Sissy, and she's served as director of the U.S. Department of State Art and Embassies program from 1994 to 1996, and she supports philanthropic and community advocacy efforts at local, national, and global levels that focus on women's empowerment, social welfare, fine arts advocacy, and education. She serves on numerous boards, including the NPR Foundation, SFMOMA, and the Contemporary Jewish Museum, and has honorary degrees from SFAI, University of San Francisco, Mills College, and my alma mater, Santa Clara University. <laughs> 
And then next to uh, our next panelist is Derek Slater. Uh, Derek defends the open internet on Google's public policy team. He supports the company's global advocacy efforts on media and telecommunications policy and engages with users on public policy issues. Derek has been writing about digital media since he bought a Diamond Rio PMP300 MP3 player. I don't know if anyone else had one of those um, as a teenager. And his work has been focused on um, recommendation engines impact on consumer behavior, how public policy can support emerging media business models, and the need for better measurements of cultural production in the digital age. Derek also partnered with Zero One to support a 2013 Zero One, fellow, um, Zero One Fellowship focused specifically on public policy. So we're happy to have Derek back with us at the Zero One Garage again. All right. So I figured, I mean, everyone up here has such an interesting background. And at first, um, when we asked the question, can the arts change public policy or can the arts affect public policy? I think they all looked at me and, and were like, I don't know if I have anything to say about that. And then within about 10 seconds of conversation with each of them, they were rattling off all of these amazing ideas that connected arts and public policy that were really tied to their own personal experiences. And I think that's what's really interesting about having each of them here is that they do have personal experiences that come at this topic from a different angle. And I think that's what's really gonna make the conversation today so enriching. Um, and so I'll, I'll kick things off with a question. And don't worry, I have pages and pages if we run out of things to talk about here. Um, but I'll, I'll kick things off and then really I'm hoping that things just kind of flow a bit organically um, between everyone up here. And then if you give us just a little bit of time, um, I'll open it up officially for questions and we'll turn it into a much larger group discussion. Um, so I guess first question, each speaker, like I was saying, brings such a wealth of knowledge and in thinking about can the arts change public policy, coming at it from the art side, like I was personally, the term public policy feels a little bit daunting um, and a little bit undefined. So I thought maybe we could kick it over to Derek first, who can help us better understand the term public policy and maybe how we should approach it within this discussion. Sure, although I, we have a lawyer on the panel too, and I'm okay, not really next, gonna, don't worry. I only play a lawyer on the internet. Um, I'm not an actual one. Uh, but look, I mean, public policy, I think the way I think about it, its simplest is the set of rules, regulations that governments, those sorts of institutions institute that shape our society. I think more broadly, it's the set of actors who influence what those rules look like and how they're, how they're put out. Um, and I, you know, what's interesting for me here, I, I approach this more from how does public policy affect art? I spend a lot of my time thinking about copyright policy or telecommunications policy and how that shapes the sort of media that's created. Um, in terms of the other direction, you know, I think a big piece of it is, you know, art can only affect public policy when it is visible and makes itself measured. A lot of times the art that matters in public policy debates is uh, sort of of the traditional sort. Public policy is typically, when it looks at the arts, focused on measuring traditional centralized distributors of media, whether that's newspapers, broadcast television stations, movies created. It doesn't do a great job of measuring all the sorts of new art that comes out, whether that's the new art in the digital age or new types of art that came out 20, 30 years ago that was simply different. And I think that's, you know, when I think about how does public policy engage with these sorts of things, that's the main thing I think about is how do you, how does it make itself visible and how do you make it measurable for the public policy world? And is public policy always tied to government or what's that relationship? For, for me, mostly, yes. Uh, I mean, it depends on how big you want to draw the circle, right? Uh, I think in terms of what constitutes public policy, there's clearly like hard law, like the net of copyright policy, copyright law says this, you get, you know, an artist gets rights to this for this amount of time. It's also the softer side of it, which I think is part of what we're talking about here, part of what this program is about, which is how can governments facilitate cultural understanding? That's public policy too, even though it's not hard law, it's, it's a bit softer. Mm -hmm. um, 
And I mean, I feel one thing that's been so lovely about this program, which is sponsored by the U.S. Um, State Department's uh, Bureau of Educational and Cultural Affairs, is kind of this idea that, you know, the arts have to matter. Um, for arts to shape public policy, we all here in this room have to believe that the arts are important um, in some way. And Ms. Swick, I'm interested kind of to hear you talk about that. You've been a long-term kind of advocate for the arts. You know, you've had roles tied, you know, to government and, and beyond. And I would love to hear you talk a little bit about why you think the arts matter when we talk about something like public policy. Um, I appreciate that. First of all, I want to thank you for inviting me. Um, this really was a lovely surprise, and I congratulate you for uh, really pursuing this. I think it's very important, and uh, I wish you good luck. I think you're going to be very successful. So uh, having said that, uh, I take, I was interested in how Derek presented himself and presented his program because he is looking at it in a very technical way, the rules and regulations, etc. And I'm sort of the one that comes in and says, wait a minute, you know, the arts really enrich people's lives. And I think for all of my adult life, that's been the most important, is the importance of the arts in enriching the human experience and how you get that across to government when they are shaping policy. How you uh, encourage them to look at the individual as a whole and think about what it is that you can offer them, and them could be anywhere in the world or close at home, and how you make them feel important enough and dignified by thinking about how that art would affect their lives. So um, I've spent my community life really uh, encouraging that and um, advocating for it, uh, knowing full well that the, the arts are sometimes one of the first things to go when situations become difficult. And I try to change that. And uh, I feel fortunate there are enough people in the world that ag can agree with that. So uh, I believe today that the arts really are looked upon in a very positive way as far as helping to enrich the policy. I don't think they necessarily shape the policy, but I think they enrich the policies that you see. And I can, I can identify some of those things, but perhaps a little bit later. I think that's interesting what you said about arts, you know, kind of sometimes being the first thing to go. Um, but I also feel like, you know, that's maybe the arts might be the first thing to go. But then in thinking about the role of the artists, the artists are often the first ones there on the ground. And, you know, what a lot of the American Arts Incubator program is about is sending the artists abroad to work with the communities around a specific social issue, um, hoping that they'll bring kind of new and innovative thinking around that. And that ties a bit to what, Sean, you've been, you know, know, working on and you have a lot of experience using human-centered design to address social issues abroad um, and I was wondering if you talk about how you feel kind of the arts and design can innovate when it comes to social issues um, beyond you know maybe other more traditional methods. Yeah I mean at its simplest I've been working on a program for the last couple of years funded by the British government and trying to think how the policy decisions that the British government makes related to international aid can be better informed by the communities. Um, and so if you look at, you know, as a design firm, you think to yourself sort of what applicability might design have for finding new solutions that are going to improve lives for people living in poverty in, say, a country like Tanzania. And I think as human-centered designers, what's really important for us is engaging in conversations with local communities. And so lots of times from a policy perspective, the British government and it's making decisions in the in the sort of realm of tens of millions of pounds sitting in London um, that will have sort of impact on the lives of the poor throughout the developing world. And so a lot of what we're trying to do is how do you sort of use design to sort of engage local communities in a conversation at the very start of this process. So what are sort of little ideas or input from communities in rural Tanzania 
what's a good idea that emerges from that community and how could we be sort of using design and sort of making and, and an approach to prototyping to sort of find ideas that seem to work at a really small level and then sort of scale it um, sort of back up. So I think at its simplest, like we're using the arts and specifically sort of design to sort of engage local communities in, in the conversation around sort of solutions in a way that hopefully then sort of impacts policy sort of way up in London. Can you maybe give a brief example of that? Um, sure. Um, so think, I mean, hopefully this is a good example, is uh, we did a design project recently um, looking at safety for women living in urban slums um, in the developing world. And there's a lot of excitement. We spent a lot of time in India. And uh, DFID, um, the organization, the client, had just spent a lot of money funding a smartphone app. Um, which was basically going to allow sort of women anywhere either to sort of hit a panic button and or look at a map and identify sort of unsafe neighborhoods. So my design team spent a lot of time sort of in Delhi um, and in sort of other places in India sort of talking to a lot of low-income women in various communities. And what we discovered was that none of the low-income women that we met had a smartphone. <laughs> um, and it was this sort of startling disconnect that seemed pretty obvious if you'd spent just a little bit of time talking to the community. And I think even more so as you got sort of more into the nuance of it all, like um, mapping and ideas of sort of mapping apps and using a smartphone to sort of navigate through safe or unsafe areas of the city. In fact, sort of the way that many folks in these communities sort of thought about maps and thought about sort of how information was transferred, there was just no way they were going to sort of look at a smartphone and sort of use it to sort of navigate from safe to unsafe areas. And so I think that by sort of engaging in dialogue early in our design process, we we're able to sort of come up with solutions that were much more sort of tailored to the, how the communities sort of actually would use sort of information exchange. There's no denying that they all had cell phones, but they were sort of simple feature phones. And so how did you sort of take an idea that made sense, but based upon sort of input from the community at an early stage in the process, sort of change the types of programs that uh, the British government was funding at sort of the high level. So, yeah. And I think, I mean, one thing you touched on is kind of some of the, the problematics that come from design, sometimes going kind of from the, the top down. But I think even in this connection between arts and policy, there's also problematics involved in that. And I'm curious to each of you, what do you think is the most problematic thing between arts and policy? Well, um, for me, the most uh, problematic might be uh, really implementing what you would like to do. And I'm, I'm talking globally that uh, if you have an art program, who is presenting that art program? Uh, who are you talking to from that particular country? Uh, are you asking them or are you telling them what you're going to be doing? I think that uh, more and more the idea of listening to the people who you're serving is really um, a key because it shows respect. It shows that you understand or want to understand the culture and you're interested in what they have to say because they're going to be your partner. And so I think that's probably, I would say, with government programs that might have you know, a very good uh, intention, that many times they're uh, inserted, they're uh, imposed, and they're, the expectation of the government is way above what the opportunity is for the, the individual communities because they haven't taken the time to really uh, brainstorm with them. And so that would, say, that would be a complication that I would see. Yeah. But it's easily resolved. Yeah. Like, Great, we have solutions. No, it's, it's, that's perfect. No, it's easily resolved when you dignify the individual. It's easily resolved when you go into a community of women who are um, at a very, very low level of, of resources, and you don't take the time to ask them what their feelings are, what they would like to see, what is their ca capacity, and that way build a relationship and a partnership. And I, uh, there's chapter and verse on that. This is not original. <laughs> I, 
To build off that a little bit, another project that we're working on now is around early childhood development and helping parents in East Africa raise healthy and strong children. And we've been doing a project where we're trying to look at ways the sort of core to our collaborative process takes place on a website. And if you look at trying to engage the voices of folks in rural Tanzania, most of them don't have access to the internet in the way that we do, right? trying to extend sort of to get their voices into this collaborative design process using uh, local community radio stations in Tanzania. But what's interesting is a lot of other sort of NGOs or government programs have sort of used community radio stations to sort of push behavior change campaigns out there. Like, you should breastfeed your kids, here's why it's good. Here's why you should, you know, do this or do that. And we sort of flipped that a little bit as we were using community radio essentially to sort of have a prompt that was like, hey, like, who are the role models for your kids, right? Who do you want your kids to be when they grow up? Um, and sort of flipping it around to sort of engage people in sort of this dialogue around sort of, hey, what are the challenges that you face as parents on a day-to-day -day basis? And so just that sort of slightly empowering to sort of shift a little bit is like not using these engagement strategies to sort of tell a community what they should be doing and instead of like sort of asking them or engaging them in the conversation in an earlier process, we saw had a sort of really empowering effect in sort of a way that we weren't, we were actually mostly just trying to get information out of them so we could figure out, so like, hey, like what are the designs that might work? But actually just the act of engaging them in that dialogue also seemed to have sort of some really positive effects. Which was that makes sense. And I know, I mean, something that's come up before is, you know, shaping public policy takes a lot of time. And, you know, what's interesting with art projects I know we were, Derek, we were talking a little bit about metrics and mm -hmm. measurement and how that can often be a challenge of how the arts can shape public policy and that how do you measure it and over what period of time do you measure it? And I don't know, it re related to the arts or otherwise, can you maybe talk a little bit about how you measure how public policy is even shaped? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, first it's a matter of thinking about what the goal is. So mm -hmm. if your goal is to incentivize uh, people to create stuff to have a diverse, vibrant culture. You can measure against that, but if you're only looking at sort of traditional types of creativity, you might miss some of it. Uh, but I think what Sissy was saying is, is interesting because th there are other goals you could have from an arts policy uh, or from a media policy. Um, <clears throat> so when it comes to, I think, incentivizing creativity and giving people the opportunity to create by every single measure, we're better than we've ever been. Right, so on, uh, on YouTube, you can go and find videos from people who create all over the world and vice versa. I mean, I think some of the, you know, the most vibrant use of YouTube is in uh, North Africa, the Middle East, um, you know, something like, I think it's in Saudi Arabia, it's like the second most YouTube watching per capita beneath the US and above Brazil. So this is like a widespread phenomenon. So we're doing good at that part. The harder part to get a, to get a handle on, the harder part I think for public policy to solve is um, okay, you can have access to all this stuff, but how do you actually get people to engage with that diversity? I personally, I mean, stepping out of sort of what the role of public policy, it's hard, you know, personally as a art consumer, as, a, as somebody who engages the media, it's hard. We have, a, we have now this abundance of stuff out there. So how do we figure out what we need to be, what the right diet of information and, and art is in our lives? It's really, that's really tricky. I, I don't know what the sort of role for policy is there, but I think that's, that's the big fundamental challenge that we have to reckon with today. Mm -hmm sense. And I'm curious, I mean, you know, we keep talking about pressing social issues and that's a big part of the program is, you know, the, the local communities and the embassies that are choosing social issues that the artists are addressing. But I'm curious, you know, individually, um, what do each of you think is one of the most pressing issues internationally that the arts has the potential to address and provoke a conversation about? Communication. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, the opportunity to communicate with um, with people and really I'll go back to it respecting them you know really appreciating their culture really understanding the particular mores um, with all due respect to the United States and its opportunities and its accomplishments so many times representatives from our country innocently and with good intent will go into a foreign country, less developed or more developed, and feel that my way is a highway. And, uh, and that, I think, is just a lack of, it's a lack of uh, 
of training is the lack of taking a look at what it is that you want to share and what it is that you want to get back from this individual and appreciating that uh, you have something to offer but they have something to offer as well. And, uh, and, the, and you know, there are lots of programs today, particularly with younger people, with uh, teenagers and post-teenage, post, uh, uh, sending them abroad before they go to college, for instance, and, the, and immersing them in a family in a, a less developed country. But the total under, uh, uh, idea of having that individual come back and be prepared to go to college, understanding that there's another, there's somebody else out there that has good ideas, there's somebody else out there that has um, a wonderful cultural background. There, there's somebody out there that they can learn from. And I could, I could bring that and make, make that something that would be important for uh, people in their 30s and their 40s and their 50s as they represent our country abroad, that they stop and realize that the individuals that they're talking to and working with come from backgrounds that really have a lot to offer and they want to share it. So that's what I mean by communication. Okay. Thinking just to sort of maybe a, a prompt or a little, I would like to hear what you say, say is like the idea of sort of not bringing sort of an American sort of, you know, sense of like the, my way or the highway. But um, I was thinking back to the challenge that we did in India with safety and security for women. And one of the sort of issues that I found to be most sort of challenging that I came up against as a designer was around issues of like gender norms and sort of a lot of sort of violence against women in a place like India coming from just sort of a, a lack of sort of equality um, for men and women in so many different ways in that country. And when you get an issue like that where it's like I try not to be like my way or the highway, but I also sometimes have trouble understanding sort of a gender, you know, a norm there yeah. that I see as sort of, so I, I sometimes trying to balance, of course I want to be culturally sensitive, but also a sense of like, I see that this is, I don't know, again, in my American sense of things like the gender inequality that's happening here is kind of not right. And so I just think it's really interesting. I think sometimes it's easy to make that call and then other times it's like balancing sensitivity with like, gosh, like this place maybe could be a little better in certain ways. And well, I don't that, know. It's, that's it's, your uh, learning experience. Yeah. You know, that's, that's enriching for you. You're going to come back from that and you're going to be, I don't want to say you're going to be a better person, but you're going to have a deeper feeling about uh, others and, right and I think that's uh, such a benefit it's just I mean it's, I think it's priceless, it's really but, priceless. but I think I was like, I think what I was wondering is like perhaps the role that art or we might play as designers or artists and sort of prompting conversations in a country like India around sort of gender norms and things like that or so not so much what I'm bringing back but what role do we as artists have in sort of perhaps prompting a discussion around these issues in countries like well, that you know that that really does take place um, I've done a, quite a bit of work in the area of domestic violence and, um, and many times uh, um, somebody who's been abused can't really verbalize, but you give them a pencil and paper and you ask them to draw a picture and that picture tells you what's happened. And it's, uh, an, ob I mean, it's, it's a, uh, an amazing way of expression uh, and, and really uh, allowing the woman to feel comfortable about what she's doing because she can't do it verbally. I think that does kind of speak to the universality of the arts, whether it's the visual arts where we tend to focus, but also, you know, music and film, um, you know, is that it is more of a universal language. And I think one thing that's interesting with sending the, the artists to these different locations is that in some ways they have more license. They can kind of walk in and say, but I'm an artist and they're expected to have 50 crazy ideas, um, you know, and so in some ways they're able to address some of these issues, you know, head on kind of under that umbrella, whereas maybe more of an Official diplomacy or business, you know, umbrella makes it a little bit less appropriate to bring up and investigate some of those same issues, which I think is something that's interesting because one of our countries in Papua New Guinea, we are looking at women's empowerment um, because it's, you know, typically one of the most dangerous countries for women. Um, if you look at a lot of the statistics out there, so these are the types of conversations certainly um, that will be had. So yeah, thank you. And Derek, you're not off the hook yet. <laughs> well, I think piggybacking on a little bit of that. 
the opportunity is really around first, I think, identity formation. That is, to be able to look at a piece of art and say not just I like that, but I'm like that. And to be able to share that with another person. And the idea that we can share that across vast distances and boundaries, it, it, that's, that's the fascinating opportunity. Mm -hmm. I, I'd like, that's a nice segue into uh, a program that uh, I was involved with in the State Department during the Clinton administration. Um, I had the privilege of serving as uh, the head of the Art and Embassies program, which is uh, an extraordinary program that settles itself amidst all the bureaucracy in, in the government. And it's purely uh, a do-good. And what it is, is that um, our country respects art and our, our artists and art. And when the ambassador is selected to go to his or her post, that person has an opportunity to individually select a collection of art of American artists that are borrowed from all of you in this room, if you happen to have American artists that are in the category that the particular ambassador would like to have, i.e. colonial art, contemporary art, whatever. Even, even rugs, hook rugs, or not hooks rugs, uh, quilted. Um, things that um, are produced by American artists, and now they want to share with those embassies abroad. And so the, the ambassador has a chance to develop this collection, and that they come into my office, and we go through a whole Rolodex of individuals like yourselves. And then we are in touch with you to see whether or not you are willing to lend. And when you're willing to lend, you're willing to lend for at least three years, which is the term of the ambassador, and of course that term can be um, extended, and so you can agree or not agree to, to do it for more than three years. But that artwork, which is beautifully brought together, you know, created the same way as a museum collection, and sent off to the to the uh, to the post, is in the in the residence of the ambassador. Not in the offices, but in the residence, because that's where all the official events take place. And so when the ambassador is entertaining, he or she is supposed to understand, uh, they're supposed to know all about the particular artists that they have, so that they can go piece by piece and talk about the art, and show how important it is for America to uh, honor its uh, arts and, uh, artists and, and the art that they produce. And, um, and I think you know, that's, a, that's communicating at, an, at, a different, at another level. And then, of course, they have an opportunity to print up a brochure which in the thousands, and they can distribute them. So they leave in place your name with your artwork photographed and a story, and, and then an experience that the ambassador had with this art collection. So I think that's an extraordinary program that is ongoing today and really cherished and a wonderful example of uh, how we respect other countries. Mm -hmm. Interesting. And kind of tied to that, you know, that idea of uh, collaboration. I mean, artists have been kind of addressing social issues and tied to policy really since the beginning of time. Um, but one thing that I think is kind of interesting at this moment is the pervasiveness of technology. And I'm curious what you see as some of the, you know, kind of challenges, but also possibilities tied to that pervasiveness of technology throughout the world. Hey, I mean, we do bring it back, it's sort of, um, like the, the challenge we used to have was uh, getting, to, getting people the resources to be able to create, disseminate, access uh, art, media, and so on. It's not that, that challenge has gone away, but we've sort of getting the pieces together to create a world of abundance. Um, it's a matter of distributing that evenly, but evenly, even when we do that, um, the question of how do you manage all that abundant input and figure out what you want to engage with 
and how you continue to engage with the diversity of people or the you know the right the right things for you uh, and get that right diet I think that's going to be that's going to continue to be a key question going forward I, mean, I think for me sometimes I think about issues of like bandwidth and access to the internet I just spent a couple weeks in China and sort of seeing how fast and cheap um, broadband and you know access on your smartphone is the internet there and the way that it's sort of changed sort of like everything if you walk around a city like Beijing or Shanghai and how glued people are to their smartphones <laughs> but then sort of contrasting that with places and you know I keep talking about it but say rural Tanzania where like there you know there's some, some simple feature phones out there there's very little internet when you do have access to the internet, it's slow and like not that many people have it. And just sort of the difference, increasing sort of, I guess, divide between the sort of the haves and the have nots related to sort of, you know, broadband access and, and fast internet. I think it's easy to contrast perhaps like Beijing and rural Tanzania. But I think from a policy perspective as well is, is coming back from China and talking to friends who live there where they, their cell phone bill each month is like 10 bucks, right? Then coming back and watching, I know the 49ers play last weekend and seeing some Sprint ad where it's like only $140 a month for like the family data plan. And you're like, holy crap, like that's a lot of money. Like I don't know when that inflation happened. But like, so, so to just think about sort of access to technology, both from a, just do you have it? in rural Tanzania, but then also like how much does it actually cost? And are you pricing a lot of people out of sort of participation in sort of sharing and getting that input up to the internet and such? So. Mm -hmm. What about the maintenance? What happens with, uh, with technical, I mean, if, if you have interactive uh, artwork, what's, what's the maintenance factor when you place it abroad? Who's in place to be there to fix it? And I think that ties a lot to the question of sustainability, which is something we've been talking about, whereas if an artist creates an art project, because with this program, they'll be creating new work while abroad, and then they leave after that three to four week period, you know, how is it sustained? Is it by the community? Is it by an arts partner who's in that same location? Is it designed to deteriorate purposefully over time? I mean, certainly, you know, tied, you know, especially to things like digital and new media, I mean, that is a big yeah. question. Well, I just wonder if you, if there was a push to really have a lot of interactive artwork abroad, the opportunity of uh, the artist going into the schools and doing a, a class, a training class, so that you're actually training, uh, whether they're college or high school students, to, um, to fix that. So what are you doing? You're not only involving them in the art, but you're giving them the opportunity to create uh, a trade to create uh, a job experience that could really motivate them going forward. And I think you've hit on that element of empowering and how can you empower these communities where the art goes into and certainly that's part of what we're trying to do with the American Arts Incubator and in that the artists are going and leading workshops to actually teach new skills to local artists in those communities so that hopefully they are the ones that can take over some of these projects and gain skills that will have them um, kind of extend and live yeah, over I was, time. I was telling, I, I don't know whether it was Sean or, or Derek, that um, in Israel today, in Jerusalem, there's a program that's called the American Academy in Jerusalem. And it's very similar to what you're doing uh, here. And uh, it's a, it can be four weeks, it could be six months. And the artists come over in residence, they're in Jerusalem. And rather than being in a studio, just doing their own artwork by themselves, they must interact with the community. They must work with the community, a group of the, wherever their neighborhood is, to uh, make sure that they're involved and both are involved with, e with each other. And it's been a wonderful experience. It's a, it's a fairly new program. I think it's only in its second or third year. Uh, and uh, they take, also take four, I think there are four artists that go at a time. Uh, and it's, it's worthwhile going online to maybe check that out. But the idea, it, once again, is not to isolate the artists, but to have them involved in uh, what's going on there. And speaking of inviting and including community, um, I'd like to open it up for some questions from the audience as well. We do have 
oh, if I could have a, we do have a microphone I don't know who's running um, that we can pass around. Um, we would appreciate it if you do stand, um, maybe say your name, introduce yourself and ask a question. It can be in general to the entire panel or it can be directed uh, specifically to one of the panelists. Harry. Mm -hmm. Hi, <clears throat> my name is Harry Saul and I want to come back to the, the headline okay. subject here. Can the arts shape public policy in the context yesterday was an election. So we sent uh, pig farmers, comedians, mm -hmm. teachers, city council members to Washington to set the agenda for our country. So I'd like to hear from you. What, what would happen if 10% of our representatives had to be artists? I mean, <laughs> are there cases where there have been artists as, you know, Congress, Congress people, and, and how would they change public policy in America with the perspective and creativity and innovation that comes from an artist perspective on our society? Did you say if 10% of the if, elected officials? What if? What if? What if 10% <laughs> what what of the elected officials were artists? Why don't you think? Why don't you think that ten percent of the of people in in the Congress are not? <laughs> you know, we don't we don't know that. We don't know what the sidebar is, what the what the the uh, off uh, the grid interest is of that particular individual. I remember years ago uh, talking to physicians, and these physicians, they were terrific artists or they were working with sculpture they were doing or they were doing craft and I mean that was their pleasure and their passion and so I wouldn't underestimate well take Diane Feinstein I don't know you all know Diane Feinstein she is a wonderful artist she does beautiful meticulous drawings that she's very modest about but very proud of and they're lovely. So anyhow, it's a, uh, there's chap, I think you you should investigate a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> oh, go ahead, Chuck. Yeah, no, I mean, I think one prompt I might have a perspective of sort of having spent first part of a career as a, a in corporate law firms with a lot of very intelligent people that self-defined as like not creative, right? And like I'm making an assumption that if in Washington or, or Sacramento there's a lot of lawyers, perhaps a decent number of folks who are very intelligent and very ambitious, but also sort of self-defined as like not creative. And I think one thing that artists can do is sort of bring this sort of spirit of sort of thinking outside the box and brainstorming and you know fill in whatever sort of word like that you want. But sort of that almost creative confidence to like sort of get outside that sort of, you know, logical thinking and be like, hey, let's try something new. Let's all just get in a room and try some crazy, like, throw some crazy crap at the wall and like see what sticks. And so, I don't know, maybe more artists would be more sort of creative confidence in, in I also think tying back to Silicon Valley, I mean, I find in general, if you talk to a hacker or a coder, they all think of themselves as artists, as artists. Um, in some yeah. way and having that same thought process, which a lot of it is kind of thinking outside the box and poking at things, tearing them down to rebuild them. And so I think that's also shaped a lot of the innovation here in Silicon and they Valley, build which great is interesting. <laughs> when I think about art shaping public policy, I think historically as well, and I think that in the past, in the early 20th century, art was used as a propaganda tool in, in many countries, um, and it, uh, there was a great deal of censorship with it as well. So going forward right now, um, there are artists now who are outside the, uh, there's Banksy or other types of artists like that, or it could be critical of the regime or politically threatening. Um, when it's intentionally controlled by government, art has been used to be the tool of the ruling class. So how do we view this under your lens? I'd say that's well. a bad thing. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm sorry to take to be a little bit more serious. I, I think that's I think a fundamental challenge in media policy is the role of public media, uh, in that first and foremost, we'd like to have everybody have the means to create, to disseminate their works, to have their voice heard. Um, but there are certain things that we want everybody 
to have some sort of shared culture around. That's part of what it is to be a national polity. Um, I think that's something, particularly in this country, we continue to struggle with. What's the role of public media? Um, in part because um, I think we worry a lot about either those uh, negative slippery slopes or we just sort of have lost confidence in the ability of public media to be efficient, effective, to not just waste money because you know, there's low expectations there. I think that's a huge, that's a huge challenge, um, which isn't shared necessarily in other parts of the world. Well, uh, I, think, I think the United States does a very good job of using art as propaganda. And, and, and I'm saying that in a positive way. Um, you're probably familiar with the uh, USAID and um, even though the USAID sometimes gets uh, shrunk <laughs> because of whatever the economy is, it's a, it's a very strong program. And it has allowed symphonies to go abroad, it's allowed dancers to go abroad, it's allowed the visual artists to go abroad, literary conferences to take place, and so on and so on. The, all of those all of those are very positive propaganda in that they show how much we value those particular disciplines. And my, I, have, I don't know how many of you know uh, Tiffany Schlein. Tiffany is a wonderful young filmmaker. And she has caught the attention of the US government with some of her films because they're very broad and they're all about, they're all global. They all are involved with you and me. Interconnected, connectedness. I mean, she's, she's had quite, quite a number of them. So what is it, when her film is shown abroad, it's connecting us to those particular countries and those individuals that we want to create relationships with. And so we're using the arts to create those relationships. And with all the, all the various disciplines that I just mentioned, that reinforces how important we feel the arts are. So um, I, see, I see that as a, a very positive thing. I'll tell you one, if you don't mind. I don't know how many of you have seen the Ai Weiwei exhibit at Alcatraz. Has anybody here seen it? OK. So, when you think about that, this, this exhibit, for the most part, uh, are Legos or paint uh, on, on the floor that uh, reference political prisoners around the world that are imprisoned by particular countries. OK, that's all right. Here, Ai Weiwei's in prison. He can't really move anywhere. But here we have it at Alcatraz. Well. Alcatraz is a U.S. property. It's a federal park. So by doing that, we are condoning the, what Ai Weiwei is doing in showing that we acknowledge the fact that here is, are these individuals who have been imprisoned because they have spoken out visually or they have spoken out verbally. And I think that's quite extraordinary. I don't, I don't know whether everybody who has seen that show realizes it, but it is a federal property. And there has to have been an agreement by the government to allow that show to take place. Mm -hmm. I think the Ai Weiwei and the At Large show at Alcatraz, I mean, it is a really interesting example of the connection of arts shaping public policy. And in that sense, it's almost, you know, Ai Weiwei using it to create international um, kind of awareness, mm -hmm. uh, you know, related to freedom of speech that isn't possible for him in China. So it's interesting that he's far more known internationally than in China, but clearly his projects are to affect international, you know, foreign and yeah. public policy. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I'm Sybil Kramer. I'm a parent volunteer at Los Altos High School. And um, I wanted to differentiate between how can art shape public policy with Ai Weiwei. Perhaps he influences public opinion and then public p opinion shapes policy or informs policy. But um, 
my question really is is a little bit more rather than public policy within a specific country shaping the public perception or communication between two groups and so we mentioned the, uh, our program in the Middle East, I did hear Edward Teller speak at one time and his feeling was the way to bring people with such different um, attitudes together was through cooperation and perhaps through art. I know there have been symphony orchestras formed between Palestinian and Israeli and, and perhaps that's another art form, music, but also visual arts that could bring people together for a common purpose to express themselves through through art and perhaps create a bridge of understanding or at least a connection somehow as one at least one piece of the puzzle yeah. and have you s experienced any of those kinds of connections yeah well, you. no i mean i most people in this room know more about the great program that you guys are, are launching tonight but i mean i think that's it itself is a sort of prime example right of like sort of the role that artists can play in sort of going to sort of a country and sort of doing an installation but then also working with a local community and i love i wrote down the uh the production workshops i think that's such a cool aspect of sort of this program so i think i mean that's a little bit that's not quite the sort of fine arts symphony part of it perhaps but i love that idea of like i don't know so anyway obvious sorry yeah. but. <laughs> <laughs> well uh I know that underneath the political noise uh, in, in Israel, there are those programs going on. And they're going on between Palestinians and the Israelis, and they're working. And they have to do with music, and they have to do with art, and they have to do with dance. And um, it's, but you have, you have to get under the political noise. You know, I mean, there's another program, kind of a sister program, that's also um, being supported by the U.S. State Department called One Beat, and that's kind of the reverse of our program in that it's taking artists who are experts in their musicians who are experts in their fields in different countries, um, and bringing them here to the United States, and then kind of creating a mashup of teams of three or four different musicians who might have, you know, an accordion player, a piano player, and a you know traditional opera singer, and they have to create music together, and then they're traveling through the U.S. and performing that as a way of um, creating these cultural connections um, and there's some great videos online about that program. Yeah. Exactly. Another question? <laughs> Come on. <laughs> In the back I see some hands. <laughs> Um, this question is not fully formed yet, but since there wasn't another question, I thought I'd take a dive in um, and attempt to ask it. Um, so the question that comes up for me around this issue of can the arts shape public policy is, um, who gets to be an artist and is that actually democratic you know is in a country even here um, where there are so many economic barriers to making a living as an artist or um, even questions of who gets to have their art be visible um, i can see intersections with that with some of the net neutrality questions that are coming up already but also just um, the fact that art does happen in historically underserved and marginalized communities but who cares and is that art actually going to inform you you know, questions of is it, it, the is public policy going to be responsive to that? Is the, you know the wider public going to be responsive to that? And are there ways that technology that you know we as a community can actually do something to make art um, democratic? And I kind of wanted to maybe push um, the question of um, yeah, what what do we do about that? Um, just creating those connections um, because. Uh, Derek, you started to say there is such a diversity of art that exists um, and we're getting more and more voices um, on the digital side of the digital divide and that's great but then how do we then actually engage you know <laughs> what, what, can, what can we do um, and how can we also just make um, art a more how can we make ourselves or our, our societies and our communities more um, hospitable to artists so those artists voices can actually matter um, yeah so that's a very kind of <laughs> meandering question but feel free to take it however you uh, feel moved 
Um, there's a lot there. <laughs> think for a second. Well, look, I think um, in terms of what we can do to get our, one's own information diet in a good state, I mean, so one is you can just say, yeah, it's, every individual has to do that. The only way of looking at it is that it's part of what being part of a community like this is about. Um, it's part of what I think programs like the one that's being launched here solves for. There are other pieces, you know, this is my sort of technical brain working, but there are ways that we can actually decide to use tools or engineer our tools that we're exposed to things that are not just, that wouldn't typically be in our line of sight. Uh, very hard. I mean, like, you know, I'm going to go home at the end of the day and I'm going to watch the shows I watch and the sports and, and you know, it's, it, it's uh, like anything else, a, a practice uh, that has to be developed over time. Um, I, the, there no, I, I think on, the, on that piece of things, I think it's very hard for public policy to affect that. That is something that will have to be developed through social norms. And we can have platforms that help educate people about it and raise the profile of it, but it takes communities like this to actually develop those norms and and build that sort of uh, that sort of practice. Okay. Um, I mean, yeah. go ahead. No, no, please. I mean, my I don't think I have as nuanced an answer to this, except to say, from a technology perspective, like I think. I don't know what the easy answer is to that, but the fact that it's a heck of a lot easier now to connect rural Tanzania to this conversation, it's not easy and it's gonna take a sort of appropriate technology solution, but that just wasn't possible 50 years ago. So again, I, that all the issues of social justice and how do you sort of give a sort of, you know, low income rural Tanzania and this social space and the social capital to sort of be an artist, but like if that can be solved for them getting sort of their message out into the world and engaging in a wider audience, that technology is there in a way that it never was before. I don't, but I don't know if we've solved how to actually implement that technology. It's not the, the easy answer, but it, it is an answer that wasn't there 50 years ago. So I'm a little optimistic, I suppose. And I, I think the technology is certainly a tremendous help. However, I think that grassroots organizing is still invaluable and necessary. That you have to go one person, two people, four people, six people, eight people, 12 people, and get a common voice and be prepared to understand your reason for doing it and then to be prepared to advocate for it. And that will sustain that program. The technology is wonderful and it does spread it. But on the, on the ground, to have people who together care and then continue to spread that caring uh, to me is much more sustainable. All right, and thank you for your questions and your participation. Everyone will be around here tonight so we can continue this conversation individually. Um, but I do want to make sure that we have time to introduce the four inaugural American Arts Incubator artists. So if the four of you would be willing to please stand um, and maybe turn around so that you can say hi to everyone else. <laughs> Um, closest to me here, we have Felipe Costablanco. He'll be traveling to the Philippines to look at envi the environmental effects uh, related to natural disasters. Uh, next to him, we have Xiaowei Wang, who will be traveling to Mongolia to focus on environmental degradation due to urbanization. And then we have Kendall Henry, who will be traveling to Papua New Guinea uh, to create and oversee projects related to women's empowerment. And we have David Burke, who is traveling to Laos to create a collaborative mural project focused on deforestation and environmental issues there. So let's give them another round of applause. Um, yeah. Really, each of these artists is a true trailblazer, and I do want to thank them for their willingness to be part of a new program here that's running out, because in addition to creating their own work, they're also going to be overseeing a micro-grant program that's funding four projects that will be created by local artists from those communities over a one-month period. So they're turning into artists and administrators and diplomats uh, on our behalf. So it's a pretty big job that each of them are doing as they travel abroad. So thank you. 
I also wanted to recognize Kate Spacek, if she could just stand up and say hello. Mm -hmm. um, uh, she's the Zero One program coordinator who really is the heart and soul of this project and pulling all of the pieces together and making sure that it all runs smoothly and has done a ton of work to bring this program together. So thank you for that. Um, and now I would like to introduce Michelle Peregrine, who's program officer in the Cultural Programs Division at the U.S. Department of State. Um, Michelle oversees the American Arts Incubator Program. She's our contact um, there, and I'd like to invite her up to say a few words tonight. So welcome, Michelle. Thank you, everyone. Good evening. Thank you, Jamie, for that introduction. Thank you all for coming out. It's fantastic to see such a fabulous response from the local community. And I want to be sure to thank the panelists for joining us tonight as well and for that lively discussion. Um, as everybody knows, we're here tonight to celebrate the launch of American Arts Incubator, which is a new initiative of the US Department of State's Bureau of Educational and Cultural Affairs, which we're implementing in collaboration with Zero One. And I thought I would just take a moment and talk a little bit about why we support these types of exchanges. For one, uh, we feel that arts exchanges are especially effective at connecting people, at fostering mutual understanding between people in the US and people abroad. And I think the arts too are also capable of creating a safe space for dialogue where uh, conversations can take place around important issues and sometimes sensitive topics. In addition to that, at least for us, we found that the arts are really effective at reaching um, uh, underserved areas and new audiences that we may not otherwise be able to reach with more traditional diplomatic tools. So I'm really excited. It's a very exciting time and that we have this new program model that I think is really set up to achieve some of these purposes. And on that note, I'm also really excited to share the news that we've decided to renew our partnership with Zero One and we will be continuing this program. <laughs> So we're going to continue the program for another cycle, which will support an additional four artists uh, joining the program sometime in the near future. And just before I conclude, I wanted to comment that we made that decision in part based on the excellent working relationship that we've established with Zero One. And I just have to say that none of this would be possible without the expertise and dedication of the team here. So a big thank you to you all and a big congratulations for reaching this important milestone. And that's the perfect segue to introduce Jules Slayton, the executive Director of Zero One. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. <laughs> Hi, all. Sometimes I think I have the best job in the world. <laughs> um, so I would also like, first off, to thank our, our guest yeah, this evening you. for a fantastic program. Jamie Austin for uh, a really great job moderating and my colleagues here at Zero One who are really, you know, you're trying to work with the best people that you can. And it really makes you a better person, but it also drives your programs forward in such deeply provocative ways. And I think, uh, you know, this is a really good example of that. So do me a favor for a second. Close your eyes. Pick a place. And pick an issue, an intractable social issue in that place. Now, insert an artist. And watch the change. Watch the, pers the perspectives shift. The awarenesses change. The provocations happen. The challenges. The opening up of new ways of thinking. You can open your eyes. <laughs> That's what Zero One does. I like to think of this place as, as not just another presenting arts facility or program, but really as a discourse platform as evidenced by the kind of discussion that we've had this evening. And what a, what a terrific opportunity that we have. And Michelle, I, I just want to thank you and all the, the, the work that we've done over the past year uh, with the State Department and your office in putting this really, really terrific program together. And we have four amazing artists who are going to place themselves in a context and shape incubators in environments that will enact social change at a deep level. So I also want to thank all of you for coming this evening and stay with Zero One over the coming year because amazing things are coming. Thank you all.